This morning we have a guest speaker, Wesley Walker. Wesley Walker is um, from Nashville, Tennessee. He preaches at the Woodson Chapel congregation there. Wesley preached his first sermon when he was nine years old. Since the age of 16, he has consistently preached. At the age of 17, he went to Bear Valley Bible Institute in Denver to go to school there, graduating, and I think began his first ministry at the age of, like, what were you, 20? 19? 19. In Corcoran, California, he preached there for a couple of years, and then he moved to Woodson Chapel, and he's been there for the last eight years. Listen, Wesley is just a, uh, a wonderful Christian man. He loves God. He loves people. He is constantly looking for opportunities to share the gospel, the good news of Jesus with those that he comes into contact with. You'll see his heart and you'll hear his heart as well as his knowledge of the scripture this morning as he talks to us about the simplicity of the cross. Wesley. I don't normally begin my sermons with thank yous, but I do want to say something just for a moment before we begin our time of study together. Not just for this weekend, I thank you all for your kindness throughout the weekend, for inviting me here, for the opportunity to preach and to visit Idaho, but also for the kindness you've shown my family even in the months before. Uh, my wife wanted to make sure that I shared with you her gratitude as well for the cards you've written, the notes we've received, the, the messages on Facebook and other places on prayers on behalf of our son. And we are happy uh, to announce that this week was a very good week. We've avoided the hospital stays. He has continued to gain weight, and we've had a, a good few, few days there in Nashville. So we are grateful for that and grateful for your prayers. And one of the things that we are looking forward to doing with Emmett at some point in his life is bringing him down to our favorite place of our family, and that is to Orlando, Florida, to Walt Disney World. A few years ago, my wife and I were given plane tickets by a couple who works for Southwest Airlines, and we were given a hotel stay by another couple at church and told to go to Florida and enjoy a vacation together. We had no kids. We weren't for sure exactly what we were going to do, but we flew down. We got into a hotel. We went different places on the coast of Florida and around Florida. In the last two days, we decided, let's go see what Disney World is like. I've been to Disneyland a few times with my wife once we, we've gotten married, but we'll, we'll see what Disney World is like. We spent two days there, and since then, we've been kind of hooked as Disney people. From Nashville to Orlando, it's about 10 hours, and so we make that road trip a couple of times a year. One time, I usually speak down there, and one time we go on vacation, and we spend our time around the Disney complex. My four-year-old now has the ability to, if we're in one particular land at Disney World, to know how to get to the ride across the way. And in fact, she's one of the efficiency people in our families, will tell us we're not taking the, the best path to get to her her next favorite ride that she wants to ride. You know, each of the Disney parks, when you get into the complex there in Orlando, has a particular icon it's known for. Uh, so you go to the Magic Kingdom and you, and you walk down what's called Main Street USA and you look up in front of you and there's this huge Cinderella's castle, right? Everything is sort of focused on that. It draws your eyes. You see it and you naturally sort of walk towards that place. And you go to Animal Kingdom, there's a thing called the Tree of Life, a massive tree that has the, the carvings of different animals throughout it. It draws you to, to make your way into the middle of the amusement park. Hollywood Studios has three or four different icons through its lifetime. A, a magician's had an earful tower, they call it, a Chinese theater. But again, they're sort of known as being symbols of that particular park. And Epcot has the golf ball thing. You know, we don't know exactly what to call it. It's, it the official name is Spaceship Earth, but it looks like a, a giant golf ball. And I remember the first time going to Epcot, I knew uh, I had to ride that particular ride. I, I had to go in the, the golf ball, and I had to ride the ride. Now, I didn't look it up online. I wanted to be completely surprised, whatever it was. And so there I am getting into the ride, assuming it's probably some indoor roller coaster. And if you've ridden the ride, it's not quite that fast. In fact, it's a pretty slow-moving ride. But it's a neat ride for what it is, and you go through the, the history of Earth, and at the end, you're supposed to create your own personal history of what you want the future to look like. And so you go through this ball, and you go from scene to scene to scene, uh, and I could probably go through and quote the scenes, because I've taken my wife and my daughters, and I'll eventually will take Emmett, and I've ridden it several times. It's just a great little ride to sort of get out of the heat of Florida and spend some time looking through history. But I remember the first time I rode the ride as it takes you through great scenes in the history of humankind, and I left somewhat disappointed. 
You begin the ride where you think that most people begin human history with, with cavemen and the stuff that's going on and wall paintings. And they talk about how this is how early people communicate. And you go from there to, to Egypt and the great civilization that gave us papyrus and the ability to ride. Then you go from, from Egypt over into the Phoenicians and the alphabet. Again, they're, they're showing you the great advancements of human history, the, the great civilizations, the great moments in history that, that pushed us forward to the next sort of, uh, of epoch of time. And you work your way through and you get to Greece and Rome and you see the things that they provided for us and you, and you move past Rome and you get into uh, uh, to the newspapers and printing presses and the Renaissance and you, and you go a little further and you, and you get into computers and space travel and the whole idea is to make you sort of feel these are the greatest moments in the history of humankind. You know, one by one, and you probably recognize from, from history books or school that these are really uh, the sort of moments that have made history. I remember the first time I rode that ride, around and around I went, and I kept looking uh, for the greatest moment in human history. Now, these are all great moments, right? Each one of them has, has helped us. We, we're here today with so many technological advances because we built upon previous generations and previous civilizations. But I kept waiting for the moment in time where I would see what really was the greatest moment in the history of the world. Now, I've rode the ride several times since then, and every time I leave with a slight disappointment. That here I am going through the history of humans, the, the, the very beginning in their mind to, to the future we're going to have, and they miss the turning point of all history. At the very center point of the history of human time, the, the greatest moment in the history of the world. So you know we're on that ride, do you hear anything about Jesus? Or do you see anything about a cross? You know we're on the ride, is there a, a, a symbol there that reminds us that during the time of those Romans... Something pretty amazing happened that changed the course of human history far more than the invention of an alphabet or the ability to write or the ability to sp travel through space or even mass communication. Something happened that changed human history in a way uh, that we're still trying to figure out all the profound nature that it did. This morning we're supposed to be speaking on the simplicity of the cross. You know, I thought as I was preparing for this message, what exactly do you say? You know, preachers try to have some sort of fresh way of saying things, some, some scheme or some way to, to put a sermon together to, to leave you with something memorable. And I began to, to work on this months ago, trying to, to figure out what exactly would I say when I'm standing up here to speak on the simplicity of the cross. And a few weeks ago, as I was finalizing these particular lessons, I remember thinking to myself, how foolish would it be to stand before an audience on the topic called the simplicity of the cross and try to overcomplicate things with my own devices. So I want to start this morning by simply sharing with you uh, the cross of Jesus. You know, we sometimes could leave a place like this and assume everyone in the audience knows about the cross. That everyone here has a thorough understanding of exactly what Jesus did in that moment in time, that moment in human history that changed the world. Or maybe in an audience like this, we think that the cross becomes old news to people who've heard the message over and over again. But I hope every time you read the gospel accounts and every time you hear the story of Jesus, it's not old news, but the same good news just said again. So let's begin this morning with the details of the cross of Jesus. I don't want to start in the garden. We know it's the garden of Gethsemane, but really it's a garden of suffering. There is Jesus, the, the man who's in the midst of the garden, sweat like blood flowing from his body, pleading with the Father to let this cup pass from me. I want you to not just remember the fact that there's Jesus in the garden, but remember the fact of what Jesus has already done before he ever reaches the garden. That God has stooped down to our level and become flesh. That God has stepped in and is dwelling among us in a way that, that we couldn't imagine. That God has, has willfully put himself within the plight of humans. And here is Jesus, hours before that faithful time in which He'll end up on a cross, pleading with the Father to remove the cup. You read that section in the garden, you see not just a, a, a man pleading with somebody who is an authority, but a son pleading with the Father. 
and the emotions that must go along with the son making the request and the father having to answer the son in those particular ways and the son not just once but twice but three times asking God, if, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. There he is in the garden knowing what he's about to face. He's human. He's probably at this point in his life at 30-something years has seen someone die of crucifixion or at least knows enough about it to know exactly how painful, humiliating, and horrendous it will be. And he asked the Father in that moment, if possible, can you take this cup from me? And the Father says no. Now it's hard to imagine a father telling a son no in that particular substance. A father looking down upon a son who he loves and cares for and the son asking God, can you remove this from me? And the father saying no. And the son agreeing, if it's your will, I'll do it. Then Luke tells us angels are sent to Jesus to strengthen Him for the moments ahead. In the garden we have Jesus at there preparing for the cross, asking the Father, take this away, and the Father telling him, I will not. And then we have betrayal. In fact, that the whole story of the cross is, is, has not just the, the, the element of death and pain, but, but an element of betrayal at the very a basic of human level of dear friends leaving behind a companion and not really caring for him. Yeah, we, we know about the first one, right? Of Judas coming up and kissing him on the cheek, a, a betrayal of somebody he spent three years with. But, but the whole thing reeks of betrayal of Peter in the next scene telling, I don't know who this man is, of disciples fleeing from Jesus, not willing to stand by Him in His moment of need. We see an emotional betrayal, an emotional crucifixion before He ever faces the physical nature of the cross because all around Him are those who betray Him. And He's arrested. And it's almost one of those comical irony things in the Scriptures here that, that the Son of God, who Jesus, who's able to walk through crowds earlier in the Gospels, whose very words have brought people to their needs, is arrested by, by men as if shackles and chains could hold in God. But yeah, there's Jesus arrested and brought, brought for what the Bible calls trials. But if you read through the particular things that happen, they're far from any sort of judicious action whatsoever. One after another, he's brought before high priests and Sanhedrin and brought before kings and he's, he's played around as a plaything for Herod and Pilate back and forth as if he simply exists for their very amusement. He's mocked and he's beaten and he's bloodied. Again, the gospel writers to some degree sort of move through with some words that, that, that the readers knew about, but maybe we don't. Words like the beatings that took place and the scourgings and, and the crucifixion. That, that they know their readers understand that, but, but do we understand the depths of what Jesus is going through? Do we understand the simplicity whenever the Bible speaks of a cross? That when the Bible speaks of a cross, it is speaking of a brutal moment. A brutal moment in time when God allows Himself to be beaten by His creation. We think of things like scourging, and I'm sure you've heard something about it. Of bone and glass ripped against flesh. Of bleeding across the back. Of fresh wounds and old wounds being opened up. Most men died before they ever got to a cross. Most died there at the whipping post as the Romans would whip them over and over again, not with some sort of, of judicious way of whipping, but simply to the amusement of men who seemed to enjoy to torment those who were under their capture. And there is Jesus beaten, not as a guilty man, but an innocent man. In fact, he's beaten simply because Pilate's trying to find a way to appease a mob. Maybe I can, I can beat him bad enough that they'll say, okay, that's enough, we're, we're fine. But it wasn't enough. The mob gathered as bloodthirsty, and they want Jesus dead. Crucify him. Crucify him. You can you imagine the chills in the crowd as you hear those words being said? Give us Barabbas, a, a man who's deserving of death, a man who, for all accounts and purposes, should have gone to a cross. Give us him back and let Jesus die instead. And there goes. Jesus, carrying a cross, 
to the place the Bible calls the place of the skull. You know, places aren't named the place of the skull because they're pleasant areas. They're named there because people go there to die. And between two criminals, two men who deserve to die, their Jesus goes to face his death. You know, I stop for a moment and I think about the wood that his body is laid on. The wood which he created, which will now be the place he rests to die. I think about the hands of the centurion by his side. The hands that Jesus created. As Colossians says, he's the creator of all things. The hands that Jesus holds together. And the hands that the Son of God creates sends nails through His hands and through His feet. And He's lifted up to die. And the Gospel writers simply say He was crucified. In our day and age, crosses and crucifixion are to some degree sanitized by the way we use the symbol. They've been taken over, I think, in a good way. A mark of death has been replaced now with the cross as a mark of hope. But, but don't think for a moment these first readers or even these first witnesses would even for a moment think that a cross was something that represented hope, right? When they read crucified, they knew exactly what that meant. Uh, the Romans liked to crucify, especially in outer areas of the empire, like places like Palestine, because those folks seemed to be rowdy every now and then. They had to prove and show the full power of what Rome could do. Uh, well, there are easier ways to kill. If you just simply wanted to kill someone, Rome had methods to do that quick and easy and efficiently. But crucifixion wasn't simply about ensuring someone died. It was ensuring they suffered. And if we go back in our mind's eye, we see a suffering Jesus. See, the cross, the simplicity of the cross has a great cost to the one who bears it. He's nailed there. Arms spread, feet bent, drowning in midair. This crucifixion was not a matter of blood loss or pain, death, but an inability to breathe. To where you move up and down and up and down and eventually your body tires out from all the pain. And you stoop over and you drown in the middle of the air for everyone to see. When we speak of the cross of Jesus, we're speaking of the fact that there is the Son of God, the Creator of the world, the one who made me and loves me, going to a cross to suffer for me. And suffer for those who are gathered, who spend their time not reflecting upon what they are witnessing, but mocking the one who is dying. He saved others. Why won't He save Himself? And understanding that by allowing Himself to die, He continues to save others. When we speak of the simplicity of the cross, I want to make sure you've got that story in your head. That account of the great cost to the Father and the Son, of, of sending Him into the world, of allowing Him to face all the, the brutality that the cross represents, for allowing Him to face that horrendous death, and allowing Him to hang there for all the world to witness. And for those of us who weren't there to read about. And in the mind of faith recognize just how tragic a simple cross is. Just how painful a piece of wood can be. But the story itself is not just a detailing of an act that evil men did. But the story is written to draw us into a relationship with God. So we see the details of the cross, but for Jesus, the details of the cross are what draw us to Him. See, the cross is one of those paradoxical things that the greatest symbol of love the world has ever seen 
is a symbol used by the Roman Empire to torture the individuals they felt were the worst in the world. The greatest symbol of love is, is a cross, a, a place in which a man goes to die because the cross is the greatest symbol of sacrifice the world has ever seen. That God would become flesh, perfect in all of His ways, unworthy of death, yet die, shows us the love and extent God will go to. A young mother was trying to explain to to her son that the love of God, if you've been in Bible classes, you know kids hear these phrases and they come home and and they ask, well, what exactly does that mean that that God loves us? Or what does it mean that God cares for us? And she's she's working through ideas and thoughts and things. And eventually the, the mother just stops and says, let's talk about God's love. And the kid says, well, how much does God love me? And the mother, maybe in a moment of wisdom, holds her hands out like the Savior on the cross. It says, God loves you this much. The drawing power of the cross. To know that the God of heaven loves us that much. I have a four-year-old and a two-year-old daughter, Presley and Audrey, and we were driving together running errands one day, and, and they're in the back seat of the car, and Audrey and Presley are talking, and Audrey is, is at the age where she wants to have Presley tell her stories. In Bible stories, she calls it Jesus stories. So she said, Presley, tell me a Jesus story. So my four-year-old is about to tell my two-year-old a story. He's a curious dad driving around Nashville. I'm just waiting to hear. Let's see what this story is like. And Presley says, I want to tell you about Jesus loving you. And then she goes on to say, Jesus loved us so much that He died for us. See, little kids understand the simplicity of the story. That the drawing power of the cross is what brings us into a relationship with God. You know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul speaks of the cross as both the wisdom of God and the power of God on display. He, he understands that certain individuals don't view the cross that way. Certain folks view the cross as, as foolishness or a stumbling block. You know, the individuals who believe they're already righteous, the cross is a foolish thing, right? If I'm already good enough, then why did Jesus have to die? If I'm already the sort of person that that I can be self-righteous, there's no need for a Savior. What a foolish act for God to send somebody to die for me. I'm already perfect. That's foolishness to that mindset. Or to the arrogant person that says, yes, I'm not always good. Sometimes I'm bad, but I'm good enough or I can work hard enough to get to heaven. Then the cross is a foolish statement. Because why send someone to die if I can eventually save myself through my own power and goodwill, my own goodness? But to those who don't believe, the very essence of the cross is foolish. It's fairy tales about an untrue God sending a, an untrue son to die for a bunch of fictitious things that, that backwoods people believe in. And there's foolishness for a lot of people in the cross. And for those, it's a stumbling block. A stumbling block to think that that God would allow His Son to die. One writer says, I can't believe in the cross anymore. I put that aside with other Middle Ages sort of, of, of theories because the cross is nothing but cosmic child abuse and I can't support that. In their mind, it's a stumbling block. But Paul says, to those who believe, it's the power and wisdom of God. The wisdom of God in the sense that this makes sense of how God can redeem sinful man. How is it that God can can redeem you and I who are full of sin? Because He who knew no sin became sin on our behalf. But it's also the power of God. Jesus said, whenever I'm lifted up, speaking of His crucifixion, that I will draw all men to Myself. You know, churches sometimes use all sorts of gimmicks to bring people into the doors. We use all sorts of gimmicks. Not not we in the sense of you guys or Woodson. I'm just saying in general, you you hear these gimmicks that people use. And sometimes they work in in gathering a crowd for a moment. But some churches seem to to build their, their sort of whole church on gimmicky sort of things. And think that's how you draw folks into a deep relationship with Jesus. Driving on the road this morning, I saw that a few of your car dealerships says, buy a car, 
get a gun. That's their, that's their thing as you go through, right? And so I'm, I'm driving through and thinking, this must be a low road rage area that they're giving away a gun with a car. Uh, or secondly, if everybody has a gun, maybe you think twice about road rage. But buy a gun, gun get a car. And on the radio, it just happened to be the pass by, the, the advertisement was saying, once again, buy a gun, get a car. It's true. Here's the gun you can get. And they have this gimmick to get you through there and buy a car. They don't tell you the fact that if you wanted to, you could avoid the car payment for the next seven years and go down the street and just buy a gun if that's what you went to buy the car for. But they hope that gimmick will draw you in. So you'll give them their money for this gun. But when it comes to really making disciples, we can use all sorts of things to gather crowds. But eventually the only power in making a disciple is the cross. The only power to, to draw people into a relationship with God is the power of the cross. And the truth is, those who believe in the cross are those who have a great debt to God. Those who believe in the cross understand they have a debt to that cross. But the story is told, and it was probably told by a preacher, so it may or may not be true. But a story is told about a Russian man who was given a job under Tsar Nicholas back in the times of Tsars in Russia, which I always worry about any time they speak, make up some like distant past and then give you the story. But the story is told about this particular man who's given a post with a large sum of money under his care. And his job was to, to dis distribute it out to the soldiers and those in battle. But this particular man was a man of low character, and he decided he would try to gamble to make money off the money that he had. And as you can imagine, eventually with any gambling, you come off below what you need. And there was a particular petition that goes out, a letter is sent around saying, the czar is coming to your field base to just check on operations. The man knew at that moment in time, the czar would want an account for exactly how much money he'd lost or where the money was. So the man wrote down all the things that he owed and all the debts that he had and all the money he was supposed to have. And he went to the cash box and he put out the cash and he realizes the sum of debts and the sum of money were not anywhere near one another. So the man decided his life was over and he was going to end it himself. And so he had planned at midnight to do just that, writing out a note, explaining what he'd done, knowing he couldn't repay the debt. And at the bottom in Russian writing, the, the, the debt is unpayable. The story goes, the man falls asleep. And the czar comes in and looks at his desk and sees the story and reads the story and understands the man's situation. And if the story is to be believed, the, the czar takes a pen out and writes, Forgiven. The debt is paid. And the man wakes up at the time in which he's supposed to, to take his life, to end it all, and he looks down and he realizes that's his signature. That's the czar's signature. He's paid my debt. When we stop for a moment and think about the cross, we understand there was a debt that we could never pay. But as our theme verse for this lesson says, God made Him to no sin who had no sin so that we might experience the righteousness of God. You and I were in a predicament with God. We had no hope. But yet God stepped in and paid our debt. And because of that, we're debtors. We're debtors to God. To lose our life for the sake of Jesus. You know, Paul, on more than one occasion, talks about the death of Christ being a grand exchange. That Jesus takes upon Himself your sin and your penalty and your death, but then in the exchange, you give your life back over to Jesus. Because that's all you can do in the face of such an amazing story. And say, Lord, here am I. What can I do? Here, here is my service. How can I render it to you? The cross prepares a debt in our heart to God in which we say, God, we are so gracious for what you've done for us that we're willing to give you our entire life over to you. You know, simple guilt doesn't motivate very often for people. For, for a short time, we, we can guilt somebody. They might change for a short time. But, but gratitude from an understanding of what God has done on the cross leads to lasting change. And that's exactly what Paul has in mind here. God has done this to you, and you should, you should feel indebted with a sense of gratitude to serve God and live your life the way Jesus would. But also to serve man. Paul says, I'm compelled by the cross to continue on in my mission. 
You know, the Bible on more than one occasion says that Jesus' death was for us. Two words in English, one word in the Greek, that simply means that for our benefit, all the things you read about at the end of the Gospel accounts happened. Yeah, we can talk about the Sanhedrin and the Jewish leaders bringing up false charges. And we can talk about the Romans being involved in the murder of an innocent man. We also have to step back and say that entire account happened because of me. That the cross was for me. And that act of love was displayed for my benefit. How can I, in the face of such love, have anything but a debt of gratitude to the one who sacrificed? How can I in any moment in time have a lukewarm or lackadaisical faith when God went that far to redeem me? You think about the redemption that we do with money. Peter calls it gold and silver, which perishes. And if you buy something that you believe is of a great price, you probably take care of it a little longer than you would if you bought something that you didn't think was very important or of a low price. But Peter says you were bought not with, not with perishable things, those things like, bl- bl- like bl- gold and silver, but with the imperishable, precious blood of God. The cross, the simple cross, is where our hope is found. And the simple cross is what motivates me to serve God. The last few months, and whether this was God's plan or not, I don't know, but the last few months God has forced me to think not just on the temporal things, but the eternal things. So my wife and I on one occasion sat down and, and contemplated, would there be a time when we buried our son? And then we thought about the hope that we have if a day like that ever happens. And that hope all centers around this message. That Jesus came into the world and that a father allowed his son to die. So that my son, my daughters, my wife, and myself, and all of you have hope. This morning, I don't want you to leave without experiencing the same hope I have. The hope of knowing that the cross of Jesus was not just something that happened for other people, but happened for you. And experiencing the forgiveness that that cross provides. If you're ready this morning to be baptized into Christ, to be connected with His death, to to receive the full benefits of the cross, then we want you not to delay. Be ready this morning to dedicate your life to God after times of struggles or in ways in which you've fallen short. Don't delay. The cross of Jesus compels us all. It's God's power, it's God's wisdom, and it's the world's only hope. The cross is simple, but the message is profound. That God loves you so much that His love was on full display in a place called the skull, displaying for us just how far God will go to redeem. This morning, come to God. Come to a God who loves you and embrace the cross of Jesus. We come forward as we stand and sing.